<laughs> Welcome to my table. All right. Okay. Um, welcome everybody to um, our group discussion on chapters five through eight of Rethinking Disability. Um, the way we're gonna tackle this is, although we're all gonna discuss on each chapter, uh, as a team, we're, we've taken the lead on specific chapters. So right now, I think it would be a good time for each of us to introduce uh, which chapter we're taking the lead on. Uh, okay, so I am taking the lead on chapter five. All right, I am taking the lead on chapter six. I'm taking the lead on chapter seven. And I'm taking the lead on chapter eight. Um, okay, so with that, let's jump right into our first discussion question, which is um, what was the big idea um, of the chapter. So if we could start with uh, Anel in chapter five, what was the big idea there? Okay, um, so I'm gonna go based on my notes. Um, the big ideas in chapter five was how to teach an inclusive classroom. The beginning of the text started off by saying a quote that I th thought that was meaningful. Um, it said, um, a teacher is like a captain of a ship who needs to get from one port to call to a destination far away as a captain, she is responsible for the well-being of all um, passengers of the journey. Um, so basically it's saying that we're responsible for the well-being of our students. Um, this chapter also discusses how teachers can make their classrooms comfortable for places for all students and ways how teachers can thoughtfully plan. Lastly, how teachers can teach content in a flexible manner. Um, creating a inclusive uh, classroom culture is extremely important by making sure we know our students well so that we can fit their cultures into our lessons. Also, this makes a classroom environment a safe um, environment for the students learning journey. Um, using UDL, it is also helpful for teachers to plan their curriculum and lessons accessible to all students. This also this chapter also went over the seven principles of UDL. So it was like a quick refresher just to like go back to what each meant. Um, UDL creates an environment that is accessible to all regardless of disability, racial, ethnic backgrounds, gender, social classes, nationality, status, language, culture, sexual orientation. Um, students are able to choose supports for themselves and it allows them opportunities to reflect on whether those supports are actually helpful to them. Um, the text um, described numerous of assistive technologies for students who struggle with reading, writing, and speaking. Uh, not only does it benefit students with disabilities, but also with students without disabilities. I like that um, comparison to the like the navigation, right? And thinking of like being like the captain of the ship how the chapter starts and then thinking of um, UDL because um, how UDL isn't like one thing you implement, like ultimately you have to design it, right? So I think that it's like how we use that framework. It's not just a tool that we implement, but it's it's something that you you have to take a lead on and actually like, if we wanted to use that metaphor, navigate through how we're gonna use it. So I, um, I think that that's a, that was a creative way for the chapter to sort of lead into UDL. I also think what's really cool about chapter five was that it also like gave us an overview of like using assistive technology, which I think it's definitely something big that's happening now that we're like in this like, what is it, post COVID? Where, you know, we kind of rely heavily on technology. Um, and then also like the classroom management aspect, which is pretty cool because, you know, every theories that we learn from are kind of different the way that they talk about it, you know? I also like um, the way that they talked about, like when we're looking at this, we have to teach from the end, like you're looking at the outer and then working yourself into like that objective, like to look at it <clears throat> and what am I hoping that everyone's gonna come out with? And, and then, then thinking, think, okay, okay, how am I going to implement this, but, but that, that it's going to be beneficial, beneficial for everybody. everybody. All right. Um, do we want to move on to um, chapter six and the big idea for chapter six? 
Oh, can I say one more thing before we go into chapter six real quick? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What I like was uh, the three useful tools that they gave us for teaching. Yeah. So, you know, they go into like the Bloom's taximony, which goes like with flexible questioning activities, which is, I think, as being like diverse learner teachers, I think it's something that we kind of have to think like, what can I do? If this is not working with this student, but what can I do to make sure this other student, as well as like, you know, with the learning styles, looking at the environment, the sociological, you know, kind of where people come from, psychological, physical, emotional, which, you know, like, it's so many barriers that we kind of have to deal with as diverse learner teachers, you know, because, you know, we don't know our students' story until they're in the classroom with us, you know? Um, and then just having that through a thoughtful planning, which I feel like we all do nowadays, <laughs> and the backward planning, like Susie mentioned earlier. All right, so for chapter six, um, I think, I like the way that these like chapters kind of align with each other. So it's kind of like breaking down everything. So, you know, we were chapter five, we talked about the UDL and how you can consider this. And so then chapter six is creating that. So this was like the whole lesson plan of it. And then it's like thinking about how we're gonna implement this, ways to be in a lesson, facilitating the engagement, bringing lessons to close. Um, we look at how a lesson should be seen and thought about. Um, it's, it's not, not just the setting, setting. Like, like we're looking, looking at instructional objectives. objectives. We want to see social objectives, objectives as well, like, like taking turns, sharing responsibilities, responsibilities, things that you normally don't, don't think of that should be in a lesson plan. You're not, or at least you don't think, oh, okay, you know, like we need to put like social objectives, but things that you're doing, like when you're putting in groups, those are part of those objectives. If you're considering having this be an individual, um, pairing them or, you know, going by depending on groups. Um, and then as you go through, um, also behavioral um, objectives in the class or individual, it would be like generating questions with modeling and then adding the prior knowledge to the skills to be demonstrated. And then having kids being um, engaged with questions. Uh, when you're explicitly introducing something to students with a meaningful engagement, uh, the opportunity for clear expectations of content and material with student engagement. Um, let's see, knowledge and ability. Also, then being able to determine, um, demonstrate the knowledge and uh, the ability to know if that lesson was, if it was um, understood. And then reviewing the lesson with target information and student connection. So it was a lot of like considerations of how you're going to place this in your lesson plan and then ways to set it up so that you're thinking, okay, we're going step by step and how I should think about where I'm putting all this information, what I want from this information. Yeah, um, based on like what we read, like generate social objectives, um, that was um, really important because sometimes we don't know how to do that. So reading into this chapter, it's able to like let us know how to do that. Yeah, I also found kind of like the, like how they put the art of lesson planning, which I think, you know, going back to like all of our experiences, you know, the way lesson planning is done through our mentors is so different, which each residency that we have, you know, like one might plan this way while I plan this other way but then kind of having an understanding like those elements that the book gave us was super like it just clarified a lot of things yeah I think like what re what really solidified in me is um I think the habit at least from my perspective is that what do I want to teach is like sort of like the question like or like what am, what's what, what what is my lesson plan going to be and the chapter really challenges that, right? It's saying like, what is the lesson that the students need, right? What is the what is the lesson that the classroom needs? And it's kind of removing your like, what I want to do in class versus what needs to happen in class based off of your students, off of the diverse needs in there. And so it just um, it's a, like a, a, a tiny tweak, but it's like a really important philosophical tweak, tweak that I think um, is is uh, should be happening more, right, in classrooms. I guess. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, like I get that, and I think um, on the any final informations to share. Like I was gonna wait for the end, but like I really like the way that they 
um, had us consider like the strips that they were showing, like um, allotting the time to plant. Like there's some things that you're like, okay, yeah. Like, I feel like we're thrown into some of this and sometimes we don't, we're not given that time to consider, like, especially when it was like in one of the chapters and, and I know that I'm going off key, but like how as new teachers, this is something that's going to take us a while for us to, <clears throat> to nail it as opposed to teachers who have been doing this and have that experience. And it's like one of those, like, it's nice for that book to be like, yeah, this is gonna take a while. And these are some points that you can use, but nothing's ever gonna be perfect. I totally agree with that. I think it's kind of feeds into like the whole like imposter syndrome because we wanna we wanna get it perfect right away, but I know it's gonna be a hurdles to get to that good standing where we're like, all right, we got this. Um, I mean, it's interesting. That's was like something that just happened right now, right? Like we're having our meetings about our, our lesson plans, right? And and like one thing I was thinking of was just like, well, I'm gonna plan my three lessons, but that's not how they're gonna go in class, you know. <laughs> and I'm just like yeah, thinking out like, lessons could take like a while to like finish one to the other, you might not even go to the next one. Yeah. And so it was like I mean, I've, I felt very like nervous, right, about it, but um, I really like like what Susie said, that it's like this stuff is, is going to take a while to like nail it down and there's got to be that flexibility and and um, it, it kind of puts me more at ease. It's like, all right, we're going to make a good plan, but then also like what happens happens and you got to adjust to it and and um, it's good. That's kind of like the challenge, but also like the gift of creativity that you have in the classroom. And also, you know, give ourselves grace, you know, like be so hard on ourselves. Any more on chapter six or should we continue chapter seven? All right. Showtime. Uh, <laughs> us. <clears throat> so for uh, chapter seven, essentially the main idea was what are some like various ways we are able to assess our students in an inclusive classroom? Um, kind of gave a little bit of a rundown on every type of assessment, which is super interesting because there was some that I was like, hey, I never really thought about this. Like, you know, um, like using like logs and journals, you have project-based learning, authentic assessments or performance that are like, you know, formal or informal, which is something that we kind of hit on, you know, through the courses that we had. But also like, you know, one thing that I didn't know was like error analysis. And I was like, what is this? I never heard of that. Um, as well as like using, um, norm referencing test, criterion referencing testing, or even just a standard to get us a baseline of like how our students are doing and like what ways can we take this when we are trying to help them out to develop that skill. I know on this chapter, I like the way like they give us, like Kosoi was saying, like there's different ways of assessing the way students are learning something. It doesn't have to be that test, you, you know, know, like, like um, there's multiple ways. I like the way that they like, like explain, you know, like he said, the journaling, you know, journaling doesn't have to be, oh, you know, which just uh, paperwork to get done. Like, you can get a grasp, a grasp of what students, students are understanding just, just from journals because it's something that is not like, oh, you know, you have to do complete sentences or everything has to be perfect. It's just grasping the knowledge of what students learned that day. Um, I like the way that they talk about the error analysis, you know, knowing that from these assessments, you're able to determine, okay, now I need to tweak something so that way I can have them understand this. But I have this data to show that maybe it wasn't the way I intended it to be. And so then you're able to modify something. Um, it was a lot of like assessing and seeing different ways for it to be assessed. Um, even like with observations, like those are informal assessments as well, you know, as you're observing students doing whatever they're doing, um, if they're working in groups and you're just observing, you're hearing this, that's a, that's a different type of assessment. So that was pretty interesting to see different ways. I think another thing that I, that also really popped up that I think I forget as like, you know, lesson planning as like doing those rubrics that I forget. I'm like, oh yeah, we got to do a rubric because it's kind of like our baseline on what we're assessing 
Um, and I really like how detailed it went and, you know, kind of like tells you the why or like the theory behind it where you're like, okay, this makes way more sense. You know, before I had this perception, I'm like, okay, I got to just do a, a rubric because I need like a grading baseline. But it's like, no, there's more to it where it's like a helpful tool to help me understand my students' development a little bit more. Yeah, and also the rubrics, if they're like scoring low or doing like really low, you could go back and like help them out and reteach what you did in the lesson. So I feel like that's why um, the rubrics are also helpful, not just to like make students feel bad that they're not knowing what they're doing. So like we could go back and just help them out more. I also thought like reading that chapter, um, just one thing that popped into my mind was like the portfolios as assessment. And because I remember in elementary school doing portfolio, like I'd have like little, my little art projects and like my sentences. And and at the end of like a unit or at the end of the year, I got my little folder that like I designed the cover of like all my work. And I remember feeling like proud of like, wow, look at everything I did. And then as I got older, like those became less and less things that that, that we did. Um, and I'm thinking it, even now, like in this class, like we're getting, doing our PTA, right? Like that's kind of like a portfolio of like our work throughout the class. Um, and so I was just like, I remember seeing that I'm like, you know what? There, I, I, there's a part of that that I liked because it wasn't just an assessment of my knowledge, but it was also like a part of like, oh, wow, I did all this work. And I'm like, I, I want to integrate that kind of assessment more in my class. Um, I also wanted to... One thing I really liked about this chapter was how it began. And it's, it's sort of with this question of um, if you teach, like, right? Like if you're, it's, the question is something like, if you teach, but the students don't learn, did you teach, right? Uh -huh. so, something like that, right? And I thought that was such a like, um, I don't know, I, I, like, what do you guys think about that question? Like I was, I, I, I read it and I'm like, that's pretty deep philosophical question like do you did you actually do the job of teaching if the student didn't learn what do you think I think when reading that quote I was like oh my god I could relate to this because it's like you know lesson planning and teaching and then I'm like okay I'm teaching to get this assessment but then I'm like when I'm looking at the students I'm like okay they're looking at me like with deers in the headlights not understanding it so it's like okay I didn't really teach because now I got to go back and reconsider what I got to reteach to them you know yeah, I, feel I like think it's like Arturo was saying, sorry, Anne, I know oh, you were going to talk. That's okay, go ahead. Um, but I think it was like Arturo was saying, um, when you had mentioned that when you consider your lesson plans, you have to think about what you're going to teach them, like not what I need to get out of them. And I think that's that whole point. Like, And it's something that we really don't think about because we're told like, you need to teach this, 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 but we're really not thinking about our students at that point like, like we're, we're just like, like oh okay I need to cover this I need to cover that instead of like okay what do my students really need out of this lesson yeah I didn't see it as a bad way or anything like that it's just more for us to reflect um yeah that's just how I saw it just to like be more reflective on that yeah I feel I felt like for me like it, it was kind of um there was a part of me that that's like well the answer to that is no, because if the students didn't learn, you didn't teach. And then there's a part of me that's like, there's also student responsibility in your learning, right? Like, like um, if I don't do the readings and I don't do the assignments, and then I say, oh, the teacher didn't teach me. <laughs> there's also the part that's like, where's my own responsibility as a student to learn? Um, but then that can also be a cop out for a teacher, right? Because it's like, well, I taught them. I don't know why they didn't learn it. So it's kind of this like tricky cycle, right? Like a, uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And I, I, I thought it was just a question that at first seems very easy to answer. But like the more you think about it, it's just like it becomes like difficult, right? Like, um, but anyway, I just think it, it's interesting. There's so many perspectives that can come from it. I think also what I really stood out for me was like kind of talking about, they talk about like, special education teachers using like the deficit based criteria before and now it's like looking at it from a strength wise I'm like okay so it makes more of a positive impact on our students rather than making them feel like poop <laughs> but that's all I got for chapter seven anybody else okay then we can move on to chapter eight um so chapter eight was all about co-teaching 
um, which seems like that's something we're all doing in the residency, right? So it seems like it's that was is a re very relevant. I mean, all these chapters were super relevant to what we're doing. Um, and what I liked about it was um, it sort of breaks down the benefits of co-teaching by group, right? So it says like, here are the benefits for general education teachers. And so like one of the benefits, for example, it lists like at least 10 for everyone, but like one for general education teachers is that if you have a co-teacher in there, like a special ed teacher, they can help provide support to students that are not identified, right? Students that would normally not get services just by having a special ed teacher in there, you're, you're, um, you're in there and supporting students that um, they don't have an IEP, but guess what? They also need supports in X, Y, and Z, right? So I think that that's a benefit to the general ed teachers. Um, one benefit to the special uh, ed teacher is that you get, um, you get to strengthen your content areas, right? So like if you're in a math class and you have a teacher that's like specialized in math and they're teaching math, like that's going to benefit you, right? Because you're in there, you're like, oh, so that's how you do that. <laughs> you're kind of learning, right? So you're also like, you're a student in there too. And you're not a content specialist. And so you're kind of getting like, oh, okay, all right. Like, so you get to get strengths. That's only going to benefit your students as well. Um, and then the benefits to like, uh, the general education students, um, it's that they have two teachers, right? Again, that they're getting support from two teachers. Um, and then the benefit to the, to the diverse learners is that um, uh, they're held to like a higher expectations, which I know um, that shouldn't be the case, right? Like it's like, regardless of what learning environment you're in, whether you're in inclusion and in resource and cluster, it should be the same expectations, but it doesn't always work out that way, right? And it's just that if you're in a general ed environment where like all students are expected to meet certain standards or certain curriculum, um, then it's kind of easier to also have those higher expectations of the diverse learners. Um, and I know we're not gonna do that, right? Like we're in a, if we're in a resource room, we're still gonna hold them to a high expectation, but it just makes it easier. Um, so that's a benefit for diverse learners. Um, yeah, sorry. I could totally relate what you mean about like the whole like becoming familiar with like a whole new concept. Cause you know, like they switch my classrooms. So it's like, I'm in this co-teaching class with computer science and I have no idea what it is, but I'm learning what the students as they go, which is super interesting. And I'm like, oh, you want to be able to do data and analytics and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm, I mean, I'm like that with math, right? Like I'm just like, uh, even, even like the sixth grade math, which is like, I think like, oh, I should know that. Like, but it's it's been such a long time since I've done it. It's like, how do, how do you do this with, how do you turn a fraction into a decimal and then divide it? And like, something that's like, I already, I knew how to do, but I had to practice it. Yeah, and the way how they teach these math lessons is like completely different to what we were taught. So it's just like, it confuses me yeah. a lot. Yeah, um, the other thing the chapter does is, it kind of talks about the stages of co-teaching. So like how in the beginning, it's kind of like two teachers. It's kind of like, it feels like the awkward like dating stage, like you're getting to know each other. Um, and it might not work great at the beginning. And it kind of goes into the history of how like teachers are used to just like, they run their own classroom, the, the door closes. It's a solitary field, right? You're in there, you're in charge. And all of a sudden you put two teachers together and it changes that dynamic and it can become challenging at first, but then eventually you can get to like, um, then going through like the, the collaborative stage is, is like the third stage, right? Where you're planning together where one teacher finishes and the other one picks up right where they finish off. And like, that, that's the goal towards getting to that. And then lastly, it talks about the six models of co-teaching, right? Which we remember um, we've gone over them in other classes as well, right? But it's just like the the one teach, one observe, right? Like the station teaching, right? So it kind of goes over all the six models of, of how to co-teach. And that's kind of the uh, what chapter eight was about. Definitely gave a lot of good information, especially because, you know, starting next year, we don't really know what kind of setting we're going to be, you know? And I think it's good to have all these tools to like, 
have that understanding of like what it could look like. I think like, yeah, that was one of the biggest things like um, it, the book was saying is sometimes you're like tippy toeing into the classroom, especially in the beginning, because you don't know, like I am always worried about stepping on toes because it's not your classroom. So as the book was saying, like, you know, special teachers always feel like they're alone, like we're out here fending for ourselves and you're coming into a classroom in a shared space, but that space technically isn't your space. So then you're coming in and you don't know how this teacher, like you can be lucky and get that teacher that will collaborate with you from day one, but then you have that teacher that it's gonna take some time and you don't know where you're placed at. All right, we got about 10 minutes y'all, sorry. All right, so let's get to the second question. Um, and uh, so that's kind of like, how have we seen these chapters in our workplace? Like what connections can we make in our workplace? Yeah, for instance, for mine, um, I, uh, from what I've seen with the connections has been like getting to know our students first in the beginning of the school year and how we learn about like their learning styles. And when we learn about their learning styles, we're able to like plan for the lesson. That's how I've seen them. I think definitely also looking at that on like UDL, it's like something that we kind of include with all of our lessons nowadays, you know, trying to think how can we reach a bigger student audience, whether it's spe special ed or the general education population. Um, you're not, I don't think you are. Okay. Um, I think um, one of the biggest things, like each one, because we are pushed into a daily thing, like we get the aspect of it all. Like we get the view of how a UDL lesson should be the way it should. So we get that from class and then into our work, we kind of like, go, okay, we need to kind of change it up, do it this way, maybe do it that way. Um, the lesson planning as we're going through creating our lesson plans and then like perfecting it as we go. We're getting that experience to be able to know what we want to put into our lesson plans. Um, looking at the assessments, like, uh, you know, being able to assess our students to determine what they know from our lesson plans. Like, I feel like all these, we all go through them. Um, we've all been in that place. Like, everybody has different settings. Like in my school, I co-teach. And it's that model where we're both teaching at the same time. Um, I even have where um, we're self-contained, so I'm teaching the class. So, you know, we're all getting that experience from all this, and I think that just benefits us. So that way it prepares us for next year, and I think that's one of the benefits of being in the residency is that we get that whole year experience instead of the two weeks. Totally agree. Just kind of being able to reflect on this, these chapter five through eight about, like, okay, what am I doing right now, and what can I do to, like, improve what I'm doing to make it more effective, you know, especially because it's like trial and error. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that a lot with my class. Like if something didn't work for first period, it's not going to work for the second period. So I have to like in the moment change what I'm going to do for them so it could be effective. I um, what I see also is like just the different stages of of co-teaching, right? Um, where we're like I have in one classroom where I think the SPED teacher and the gen ed teacher, we're, we're like there together. We're like, we're, we're joking. We're also like, we're, we're feeding off of each other and there's great energy. Then there's another classroom I go in and it's like, all right, gen ed teacher's in charge. They're teaching the lesson. I'm just sitting, staying out of the way. And then once the students are, get their independent practice, that's where I go in and like help, you know, support the diverse learners. But that's, that's kind of like that beginning stage so it's just like you, from classroom to classroom, it's also different stages that 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 I saw. So I, just reading the chapter, I was like, I recognize all of these stages because I have all of them at my same school. So that was interesting. Yeah, right. I think I think that's one of the benefits, like seeing that being in special ed, we get all those models, like the co-teaching models. We are thrown into all of them and being able to see it if 
we're not only in self-contained because there are some that get that self-contained, but it, it is. You can go from one class, like I have a second grade math class where I co-teach and literally we're teaching the lesson at the same time. And then I go into my civics, uh, social science class and she's doing all the teaching and I'm just there doing nothing, just observing the students. And it's like night and day, but yeah. Um, all right, should we move on to like the new word that we learned? Just to wrap up. Yeah. Mine was a uh, taxonomy. Um, so in this context, and then Muslim taxonomy is a set of three hierarchical models used for classification of education learning objectives into a complexity and specificity. Um, yeah, that's what I do, what that meant in the chapter. Anybody else? I had the same word. Yeah. Okay. For me, it was a word that the, the oh, from, Are we talking in general or um, for each chapter? I think just in general. It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, for me, it was finite, which I was like, what is this word? And it's just kind of like definitions of having limits or bounds, which I was like, okay, that makes more sense when like assessing. Yeah, for me, it was the word itinerant. I was like, what is that? And it, <laughs> and it just means that like, um, like going from place to place so that like, you know, if you're in the put like that experience of going to different, um, you know, now I'm in this classroom for English. Now I'm in this classroom for math. Now, so that like your schedule as like a SPED teacher is itinerant, right? It's going from place to place. Um, all right, then I think we've reached our final questions, which is just, would we recommend our chapters? Yes, because um, it shows the importance of UDL um, and how we use it in our lessons and stuff like that and how our classrooms are, should be set up as like, so we could create a safe environment for our students. And it just doesn't mean all oh, writing like cute little words on the on the on the walls is also like um making the students feel comfortable being in your class um i would also um recommend it because it breaks down what a lesson plan should um not what it should have i don't feel like it's what it should have it should be what you should consider putting it into and how you should look at it so like um the way you're going to develop it um it gives you like steps and processes. So like you can rethink, okay, like this is what I should be considering when I make my lesson plan. I think definitely chapter seven is really great. I think especially as special ed teachers, you know, we definitely need to know the different type of assessments to do. But I think definitely chapter five through seven will be like the framework and then kind of chapter eight into it through those like the co-teaching will be like finalizing that house, you know, but. Yeah, I would recommend these specifically for any like new beginning teacher. Yeah, um, I would definitely recommend all of these. Um, chapter eight spe specifically for me, I, what I like is the list of like the benefits. Um, it's over 40 benefits to co-teaching that are identified in the chapter. And not that we're gonna memorize all of those, but it's nice to like be able to go back to them. Um, just not and I, and I feel that way not because like we need to be we need proof that co-teaching is good or anything not 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 for that reason but because as we've already identified there's challenges to co-teaching so like when it gets hard and maybe you're stuck with a teacher it is not working or like you're like kind of like if it when if, if you're in that beginning stage and you're like this is not working out at all it's kind of helpful to go back to like well why why are we going through this thing this hard anyway like, why is, why am I going through this stress? And it's like, well, it, we're going through this stress because it matters and it has all these benefits. So it's kind of nice to like, as a sort of reminder of like, um, there will be challenges to co-teaching, but it's actually important work. Um, so I think I would recommend it for that. No, definitely. I think it's just a really great, like foundational chapters to kind of help us and even reflect to when we're back in like, you know, in our first year teaching and be like, what was the benefit of this again? Hold on, or what? Yeah. You know? yeah. um, all right, we got less than a minute. Any final thoughts, comments, concerns, emotional outbursts? 
um you know the good stuff <laughs> i mean i would say like going back to that bloom's like taxonomy right like i think we each had that higher order learning here, right? Like we made connections outside of the classroom. We we took the reading and didn't just summarize it, but we connected it to our work. We connected it to our classrooms. I think we're 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 expanding. So I think we all. Um, I want to like you know thank everybody for like having a wonderful discussion today. All right, y'all. Yeah, well, I don't know when this will stop, but nice talking, y'all. All right. All right.